I don't question the intentions of anybody in here, including Earl Blumenauer over there. We underestimated outlays for fiscal year 23 by $564 billion, or 9%, and we overestimated revenues by $477 billion. And the first lyrics are, we've been swinging and missing. It ain't broke yet, but it damn sure needs fixing. To one of my best buddies who's also leaving this great and, and yet dysfunctional institution. How does it feel to wake up every day, go to work, and feel like you're shooting rubber bands at the moon? I got a Yeti cooler here. Let's take a journey down uh, a racial equity road. Would you agree spending is the cancer in this country? I wouldn't get mad, okay. but well, I'd get curious. There's still two things that are mysteries to me. Yeah, he would. Uh, pro wrestling and CBO scoring. Can I get you to call my wife and tell her that I was right? <laughs> Welcome to the Committee on the Budget's hearing on oversight of the Congressional Budget Office. Today we'll hear testimony from the Honorable Philip Swagel, the Director of the Congressional Budget Office. I want everyone to understand that, from, uh, that we haven't had an oversight hearing, uh, which is our congressional and constitutional responsibility in six years. In six years. So before I levy the constructive criticism on your operation and have constructively critical questions of you. I want to first uh, take ownership of uh, and speak to Congress's responsibility and oversight. We have 40% roughly of our programs, departments, agencies that have not been authorized that we continue to fund. That is a massive uh, dereliction of oversight responsibility. We have a growing amount of improper payments. Uh, and what was 150 billion a year prior to COVID is now 230 billion a year. And the authorizing committees, the oversight committee, the budget committee, we're not doing uh, our job well in, in stewardship of tax dollars by allowing that improper payment number to continue to grow with very little done to bend the curve on that. So compared with our May 2022 projections, we underestimated outlays for fiscal year 23 by $564 billion or 9%, and we overestimated revenues by $477 billion, which is 11%. So together, that's the trillion dollar uh, miss, so to speak. If being a good guy and a smart guy were the only measures of success, you'd be an A+. Plus. And if intentions were uh, the measure of success for Congress, probably we'd all be A+, plus because I don't question the intentions of anybody in here, including Earl Blumenauer over there. I know I am, but it's true. I think the intentions generally are, are good. Do you look, I referenced that approximately 270 uh, employees at, at Congressional Budget Office. Um, as you look at the responsibilities that Congress uh, has placed on the Congressional Budget Office and the um, staff and budget that you have, how would you assess where you are right now in terms of having the resources you need to uh, conduct your work? Um, so we've been shrinking since really since the December 2022 appropriations. Um, we've not been filling vacancies, and it means I have vacancies in some key positions, like our Medicare cost estimates unit, which is one of our busiest, the busiest parts. We lost someone and, and, and can't replace them. We have someone very senior on, who works on the appropriations who's about to leave for a great opportunity. I can't replace him, and, and on. Later this week, I'll introduce legislation to provide an exemption from the Privacy Act. Can you discuss the current restrictions placed on the CBO by the Privacy Act in 1974 um, and how it hinders your ability to produce, a, or does it hinder your ability to produce accurate and timely cost estimates? Um, so that it, it's, an, it's a, in some sense a, a similar question to what, um, in some ways, to what I, uh, I answered with Mr. Boyle, that we think we have the authority to get information from executive branch agencies. They will sometimes point to the Privacy Act and say, well, even though the Budget Act says you can get it, the, Pri the Privacy Act says maybe not. And so that, in some sense, GAO has more authority. You know, they have a, there's st So good if we had a statutory change to make it clear, right? Yeah, so that's, that's, 
legislation that, um, that, that we would certainly appreciate. Looks like about roughly one third uh, was due to actions taken by the administration after you did your projection, right? A, a big Roughly one third, right. <clears throat> about 300 some. So is that, is that unusual? Ah, I mean, it was an unusually large miss. Well, I'm saying, is it unusual for the administration to take actions uh, that are not authorized essentially by Congress? Um, <clears throat> It was unusual from our perspective. And, yes. You know, in some sense, we're, we're trying I to- I mean, these, these, were, these were actions that you could not have been aware of, correct? Because they were, they were done unilaterally by the administration outside of the authority of Congress. That's correct. Right. So I think it's important yeah. we get that on the record. Uh, th this was extraordinary activity by mm -hmm. uh, the president in spending what we would allege were, uh, it, it was, he was unauthorized to do so, and this were out, outside of his authority. So no, that's number one. And then number two, I think about a third of the projections where you just simply miss the economic uh, projections. Mm -hmm. That, that's right. Why? Why, why? why would you have missed? I mean, it's a, again, that's a big miss. Um, so can you, can you tell us why you would have missed that in this particular time? Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> it's just, there's, there's two pieces to it. And it, I'll, I'll talk about inflation, but the same thing applies to interest rates. And, and there it's just, it's what you said, it's just a miss. And it affects the you know, revenues and, and outlays. The economy was changing rapidly at the beginning of 2022 when we were doing our forecast. And our process is that we have to do the, the economics before we do the budget. You know, the analyst for unemployment insurance, she has to know well, what's the unemployment rate gonna be you know, seven years from now. So we, we have to do the forecast early. And when the economy is changing quickly as it was in, 20, in early 2022, even two months, you know, sure. doing a forecast two months early. The, so it's a mix of those. And I, How much would a fiscal commission cost? What's your estimate? Uh, so our estimate of the cost of the legislation was $12 million in discretionary spending, some for the operation of the commission, and then much of it for the public uh, outreach campaign that was part of the legislation. There's a current country song by Bailey Zimmerman. The title is Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And the first lyrics are, we've been swinging and missing. It ain't broke yet, but it damn sure needs fixing. Uh, we could probably apply that, but I would suggest you... Um, Unlike the song, we're pretty, pretty broken right now in, in a few different areas. When, if ever, will the CBO be able to dispense with its rule of thumb to assign a certain percentage of total cost as a mandatory cost for all affected legislation? Uh, okay. No, no, thank you. And um, everything you described is, is uh, the, the way we do it. Um, so when we looked at the TEF, we you know, uh, talk to the VA about how they would implement, you know, as best they, you know, they, they could tell us. And the, the rule of thumb was developed based on that and based on the data on the, the Gulf. Um, uh, now, I want to, I want to, I'm going to get to it because you could go on this and the rest of my time will no, be I'll, gone I'll, in a heartbeat. But the point yeah, is, yeah. you know it. Did the Congress not get the wording right in the legislation? Because we're looking in the mirror here. And we could have done better because what the House did was good wording, but we ended up taking the Senate wording in the end game, and it created that, that loophole or that created that uniquely soft area that puts us all between a rock and the hard place. And I'm not trying to lay blame on the Senate, but I think the House should have pushed back, and we have a chance to rectify this in the future. Is that fair? That, that's fair, and we are, we are ready to work with you and with the committee to, find, to think about different legislative approaches so to get, get out of the rock yeah, because this I'm wondering if, based on the success of policies recently, if that raises your confidence level in terms of the projections that are on the table now looking forward. Um, it, it does. I mean, the, the lower inflation... Um, gives us much more confidence that we've we've got it better, and that our projections, say on inflation, are are more on target than what we had in, that I talked about in my testimony, and that affects revenues, it affects outlays. I'm going to yield five minutes to one of my best buddies, who's also leaving this great and and yet dysfunctional institution, Drew Ferguson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Direct Swagel, first question to you. How does it feel to wake up every day, go to work, and feel like you're shooting rubber bands at the moon? <laughs> I'm here to support you. So that's, that is my, that's my Yeah, mission. well, we, we do it too. My point is, is you shoot rubber bands at the moon every single day, year in and year out, and you don't hit the target. You don't hit the target. Every time you give us a 10-year score, from that date forward to the 10-year mark, what's, what's your accuracy? How, how, how accurate are you on day one when you tell us a program's gonna cost $5 billion or $12 billion, and you get to year 10, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your hit and miss rate? Uh, you know, it, it just- Yeah, just, just what's your hit and miss rate? You know, it varies so much. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I can't give you an overall because I can give you some, some quick examples on like where we got it wrong, where we got it right. But no, 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 no. What, what I'm looking for yeah. is that I, I want this body to understand, and we all want to understand the predictability that our friend from Oregon talked about. Um, if you're going to give us a 10-year number, okay, and then we go out 10 years and we're not even in the ballpark, we're half of that number. That, that is, we're not making really sound decisions because the, the, the accuracy is so far off at the 10-year mark. I don't think that's a function of you not being able to do your job. I think that's a function of a really bad system. Um, um, before we, we lose our friend, Mr. Higgins, for the last time, I got a Yeti cooler here. The, the guys that created Yeti coolers are graduates of Texas Tech University, my alma mater. So it says budget committee. We appreciate this is the best your budget committee colleagues could come up with was a Yeti cooler um, mug. And then I'm going to give you, as your friend, a food, fuel, and fiber shirt. Nice. And so that's on behalf of the that's on behalf of the people from God's country in West Texas. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Y'all give it up for Brian, please. How do you propose we get a better job? Of how you, would you propose we would get a better job of accounting for the returns we get uh, on the federal investments that we make, so we really are accurate about what, what things really cost over time? No, no, thank you. And I've heard that from, from from you and many of your colleagues that we need to provide you with information beyond the ten-year window for exactly what you said. You know, you you help a child at age two. Well, at age twenty-two, they'll have higher earnings. They'll pay taxes. And that applies to many things. And so we're working on that for the budget, you know, the sort of budget enforcement mechanisms. Those are generally within the 10-year window. So that's, you know, that's, that's our, you know, our requirement. But we're working hard to figure out ways to provide you with that information over the 10-year the window. And out, and this is as far as is, um, is useful to you. Just so maybe flesh out a little bit, because we've been talking about this for a long time. How, how do you propose we... What do you think those tools are going to look like? Can you, can you preview that for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you some of the challenges. You know, one is just, you know, a dollar in year 22 is different than a dollar in year two. And so providing information, not just in nominal dollars, but in net present value. Right. So that's, that's one. And finding a way to, you know, that you don't need a finance PhD to, you know, kind of understand what's going on. So that's, that's one thing we're working on. This, another one is the, the comprehensiveness. So there will be benefits, you know, improve a child's life, they pay taxes, but they're also going to draw on some, you know, some benefits, whether health subsidies or other yeah. things, and try to get all of those pieces at all of the stages of their life. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, that is a challenge, but that we're working on. Could you describe the collaborative process between CBO and JCT in, develop, in developing fiscal projections? Uh, do you share the methodologies and responsibilities? and what lessons learned. I, I was fascinated to kind of come in, and I always want to find as much, anything that's duplicative, like I want to just get rid of it out back here. Can you just share some of your comments on that? Okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll say 23 seconds worth, and uh, happy to come and, and tell you more. So, so we're sister agencies. Anything that changes the tax code, they do. We stay out of their lane. So the bill today, there, that's being voted on today, there's a cost estimate that says CBO, every number in there is from JCT. From JCT. By statute. Healthcare, the people and taxes are so woven together, we work collaboratively with them. And so that, that's just two examples um, of it. But it's you know, sort of statute by uh, uh, piece of legislation by legislation. We work collaboratively, but some things that are theirs and we stay out of their lane. 
Can you talk about the importance of interest rates to our debt and deficits? And pretty straightforward question, should Congress consider prioritizing deficit reduction when interest rates rise? Uh, you know, as the debt has risen, our vulnerability to higher interest rates has gone up. And by the same token, if there were you know, credible deficit reduction, that would lead to a positive effect in terms of lower interest rates. So there's a virtuous cir uh, circle to be had there. Can you explain how this credit, credit contributed to the overestimates and underestimates and how they impact your corrected projections? Uh, no, no, so as you said, the ERTC was meant to support businesses you know, for the challenges they had in the pandemic. Businesses now can amend their tax filings from several years ago during the pandemic, and that's the activity that we see. In 2023, there's this, I think cottage industry is the right word, of the business, of the ads that you, you said, helping businesses do that amending. And then the IRS, you know, it would be expected to send out uh, uh, checks in response. And, and how do we compare that with other models like uh, Penn Wharton or the University of Chicago uh, and, and the, their differences in projections? No, no, thank you. And, and, uh, and, and I agree with, with the importance of what you said. Um, one key area that I'm pushing on is our ability to do dynamic analysis, to get those relationships between changes in tax policy and the economy and then the feedbacks to, rev to revenue. Um, we've done it in the past. We did it with the 2017 Tax Act. But we haven't, and we've done a few other little things, but I'm looking at what major legislation could we, you know, be in, make sure that we're in position to do. And so tax is one, um, immigration is another, and obviously CBO has no opinion on what the right immigration legislation is, but I want to make sure that we're in position that if there is, we would be ready to say, what's the effect on the economy? What's the effect on, you know, the dynamic effect for what, and again, whatever legislation comes forward. Yeah. What kind of comparison or analysis do you do today of actuals versus what you're forecasted? I mean, do you, do you actually sit down at the end of the year or the end of the quarter and come back and look and say, well, this worked, this didn't, and, and how do we adust that or tweak that and, and yeah. I know, kind of a scorecard yourself? No, that's, that. that's right. So we do that in, in two ways. One is on the account level that generally twice or sometimes three times a year, lately it's been twice just as the press of business, every analyst sits down with managers and with me and we go through line by line, okay? You know, f f snap benefits, it was higher and here's why, you know, whatever, every, every line. So on the micro level, then we look at the overall. And so that's the trillion dollar miss that came from our um, report at the end of last year going at the, the big picture level of the, the you know, the miss that we had. Your report stated, though, that opioid-involved deaths have continued to increase after federal laws on this issue were enacted. And initially, we had a slowing, but then it was preceded by years uh, that we saw a rapidly um, increase in, in deaths related to the pandemic. So clearly, our investments, while significant, you know, haven't gone far enough or haven't been as effective as we need them to be. So can you just tell us a little bit about why it's so important to review the impact and efficacy of, of enacted legislation in charting a better path forward? No, uh, no thank you. Um, we are working hard on that, on looking at the impact of legislation and providing you with information on, you know, this worked, this didn't seem to work. Not, you know, never to tell you what to do, but to, to help you decide. Um, and it's one of the, is a shortcomings of that first report that you said that we couldn't evaluate what Congress had done just because it was too new. Yeah. And so that's what we're working on now, we're continuing to work, uh, work on, is a follow-up to that report with more evaluation. And, and some of it might be tentative, but if we can point you to say, here was the impact of you know, this program and that program, we're not there yet, but, but I agree, that's, it's essential for us to do it and we're working hard on it. Dr. Swagel, in your testimony, you addressed the various components that contributed to CBO's multi or trillion dollar underestimation, underestimation of our 2023 deficit. But briefly, what changes are you making to, in, to the model to ensure that these errors aren't repeated again next year? <laughs> no, thank you. So, um, uh, you know, we've, I've looked at this carefully and, and 
the pieces that were the miss was entirely ours. That's what I've been focusing on. You know, the things the administration did something. You know, I just I don't think I could have reasonably predicted that. Um, but like the inflation forecast, the interest rate forecast, that was our. You know, we were off, and we've worked hard to, to get that right. So specific to my question. What changes are you making at this point in time to ensure that we get a more accurate forecast next year? Yeah, so I looked carefully at, well, why did we get it wrong? Why, we, we had high inflation, but inflation was much higher even than we said. So, well, why, what did we miss? And we missed you know, some aspects of what was happening on supply chains. And so we've worked much harder. And then the interaction of the, in terms of the fiscal policy with the supply chain disruption, we, we missed that, some of that interaction and so we've worked hard to get that better. And, and you mentioned you're focused on the things that you can control, which I think is the appropriate uh, steps to take. But you also mentioned things that the Biden administration did last year that exacerbated our uh, deficit. Can you provide maybe an example or two of the single biggest things that the Biden administration did in terms of their executive orders of what you might call broad interpretation of legislation that contributed to last year's sky high deficit? Okay, and I'll mention maybe three quickly. You know, one is on student loans. And there, you know, we just, we estimate current law, and when they take these actions, we tally them, we, we work with the Edit Ed and Workforce Committee so they understand them, but it's gonna be an error for us. Um, two is the, um, the revenue delays from the tax, disaster tax declaration. That's gonna be a shift of timing. Revenues, instead of coming in in 23, will come in in 24. So it was a miss for 23, we have to work hard to make sure we don't, you know, get the same miss in the other direction. Um, and then the corporate, the last one is the corporate minimum tax. The administration, right, the law was enacted. The administration hasn't yet put on gui out a guidance, so corporations haven't yet paid the money. It will show up, but again, it's gonna show up in, in the future. What is the singular uh, major point that you look at when you score legislation? Um, you know, for many things, it's, it's how many people are affected and what's the, the cost or savings per person. And so a lot of times that's what it boils down to is the sort of P times Q. Let's take a journey down uh, a racial equity road mm. uh, and uh, give us a sense uh, in particular of the numbers that we find in people of color and particularly African Americans. Uh, I think they have made at least some uh, progress under the Biden administration on unemployment, mm -hmm. um, but it is not in housing, healthcare. And so have you taken a look, since we serve a very broad, diverse nation, the, the issues that we are confronting with racial inequity? Yes, um, if it's okay, I, I'm gonna, admit, can I mention three ways that we are trying to meet that, that you know, yes, that and I, I, information? Yes, I think we uh, spoke before of the HR 40 concept of, uh, Reparations. Reparations, right. And, and, and I apologize, we haven't analyzed that. Mm -hmm. But on health care that you mentioned, we have been working for that our, to make it so that we can analyze health insurance and coverage by, by um, breaking it down by race. So that, as you said, there's great in inequality you know, by different dimensions, and one of them is race. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to analyze that. We are we're getting close, and so we'll be able to do that. The same on tax policy. We have a, there's a slideshow on our website from some of our uh, analysts. We've been working with the Census Bureau to be able to relate tax information by race, which, you know, of course you don't put your race on your tax, on your 1040, but we've been trying to make it so that we could at least say something. Um, and then the last one we're doing is flood insurance. And this is, um, uh, Representative Waters uh, has been, um, you know, instructing us to do this, is to say, well, what's the effect of flooding by different communities, not just by location, but by race. And so we've been working hard on that as well. Would you agree spending is the cancer in this country? Overspending? Overspending, uh, Overspending presents economic cancer. difficulties. All right, let, me, let me just give you a rundown. In May of 22, the projected outlay was $5.9 uh, in 23. The actual from the CBO was 6.5. Mm -hmm. Net interest spending. Uh, it was 217 billion higher than projected. Higher education, 143 billion higher than projected by the CBO. FDIC, 99 billion higher than projected. SNAP, 18 billion higher than projected. Now, I'm in the real estate business. If I, if you and your family were starting a business, and I 
consistently gave you uh, figures that were much higher that you had to get a loan for. Uh, would you keep me on board? And as I heard one of my friends from the other side, they was said what you needed. I mean, it's costing this taxpayers to fund the CBO $63 million a year. You've got 275 employees. Would you tell me that you needed more? If I, if I were the scenario I presented to you, would you want to give me more money to put bad figures in front of you? Well, I'd say two things. One is I'd want to know, well, what was it? What went wrong? And that's what I, I tried to explain some of that in my testimony. And then two is I'd say, well, with the additional funds, what would you do? Would it make it better? Would, would you get more of the same? But you'd be pretty mad, wouldn't you, if, if, I, uh, if I gave you bad figures consistently? I, I mean, well, you can see I'm, I, I don't get mad easily. So I, I wouldn't get mad, okay. but well, who, I, let me I, ask you I get this. curious. Describe the green energy loan programs and the costs on the FCRA. Yep. Uh, fair value analysis? Uh, so the, uh, the the green tax credit programs. Okay. The challenge there is that um, well, first of all, JCT. Those are JCT numbers that we then update. Right. Um, you know, the market has evolved quickly, and the administration has implemented those programs in ways that were more expansive than I think JCT had um, had put into into their estimate. So next week, with the economic outlook, we'll have more details they're going to be substantially more expensive than the Joint Committee on Taxation originally estimated. Let me, let me just suggest to you from our side, and you've, you've kept hearing it, we've got to get accurate figures, and heads need to roll in your department. I don't think you need more money. Uh, the 270 employees, the $63 million we're paying the CBO to get numbers that never match up, particularly on the spending level, is atrocious. Uh, and I've been around a long time. Um, there's still two things that are mysteries to me. Yeah, he uh, pro wrestling and CBO scoring. So if you can help me figure out either one of those, I think we'll be moving in the right direction. If you could just discuss momentarily the research CBO has done on the impact of federal policy making on employment, on economic growth in these most distressed communities, and then what additional resources or technical capabilities you would need if, if we were able to expand that work. Um, and I'll start by saying we do some, but not a lot and not enough. And so I, I, I'm grateful to this for pointing me to it as something that we need to focus on more. Um, and in the future, we will. We will go back and look at the effect of the infrastructure bill and the CHIPS bill. And I, I know that re these regional effects are going to be an important part of the story of those bills. So we'll, we'll get there in the future. We've done a little bit of it in the past. And so I, as an example, some of the provisions in the Build Back Better um, legislation that we scored that was when it was voted on in the House had a regional aspect. And so the, say, child care subsidies or preschool subsidies, we called state by state to talk to them to figure out, okay, are you gonna take up the program? What would you do? And then we added that up and that was our estimate. So we, you know, that sort of thing a little bit, but not, you know, really not the big picture issues that you, you're focused on. And so I can only apologize. And, we got to do better. Um, according to the CBO report titled CBO's recent publications and work in progress as of December 31st, 2023, there were several items of concern, um, it, it, for me concern, about how you guys are, are moving into the climate hysteria realm. Um, and so I'll, I'll quote from, from the CBO's drafting report. You were evaluating the effects of climate change on markets for property and casualty insurance. You were summarizing the risk that climate changes pose for the budget and the economy. Uh, CBO spent countless hours and resources publishing uh, reports titled, quote, carbon capture storage in the United States. I can't see how that has anything to do with the budget. Emissions of carbon dioxide in the electric power sector. Again, how does that relate to core mission? Emissions of carbon dioxide in the transportation sector. Um, so mission creep absolutely to me is clear in this uh, and the intellectual heft borrowing of assigning staff to work on that type of activity when we're missing uh, projections in the trillion uh, dollar range. And so I'd just like for you to, you know, put your bipartisan, mm -hmm. straight reasoning, what's the mission of CBO, why are we getting involved in this? Okay, no, thank you, and, and, and thank you 
you know, this is something that, that started as with me as director, is this quarterly report and what we're working on. So you know, thank you for, for mentioning it. Um, we, we do have a pretty robust work program on climate, and you mentioned some of it. Um, and so there's two pieces to it. One is that, well, yeah, I'll, I'll say the two pieces and say why we got there. I'll, I'll, I'll be fast. Um, it's to say, if there is eventual climate legislation, we want to be ready for it. And so that's why we, we're looking at the transportation sector, we're looking at uh, manufacturing, elect, electric power generation, the places where, well, the Biden administration and others have so just focused on as potential legislation. And of course, we have no, no view on what the right thing is. I want to make, make sure we're ready to estimate it. And so that's, that's a big piece of it. And then second, we respond to, to members. If a chair or a ranking member of a committee has jurisdiction, wants a report on something, and I can do it, we're going to do, we're going to do it. And so some of the reports that you mentioned were you know, directed, we were directed to do it. And so we're responding to, uh, to congressional interest. Um, so, but is the CBO the proper placement for those requests? Is there not GAO, uh, Congressional Research Service? It's the better placement mm -hmm. when they're asking you to analyze the amount of storage capacity for carbon in the United States. Again, mm -hmm. staff devoted to that when it could go to CRS or GAO, mm -hmm. that steals from the time and placement of getting the numbers correct that this committee absolutely has to have to make you know, the biggest decision Congress is tasked with, which is power of the purse. No, that, that's right. And that's, this is, that's part of the ch management challenge is allocating resources. And there, there is substantial congressional interest in the topic. And that's why we have, you know, these people working on it. Um, Do you have the ability to say, we're not the proper entity for this? This needs to go to CRS. This needs to go to GAO. Um, you know, there's some things that there's some things that that does happen. You know, it's, it's especially something backward looking, evaluate past legislation. GAO, you know, has many more people, so we do it sometimes. How many staff are uh, nine seconds? Yeah, I apologize sure. for interrupting yeah, yeah, you. Sorry. How many staff are associated with anything in this realm? How many total staff do you have associated in, in uh, this realm? Uh, it's it could be a dozen, eight. I mean, there's a dozen working in micro. So but twelve people at approximately hundred thousand dollar salaries. That's real numbers. I'm including people who work on lots of different things because, you know, like our financial modelers would help with our flood insurance, for, you know, for example. So there's, you know, there's a core group that's four or five, and then there's, you know, six to ten to, you know, eight others who contribute in various ways. So I'll just to yield with this, Mr. Chairman, appreciate your indulgence. We're missing it by miles in terms of our projections. This is a new initiative. Maybe there's a correlation with that yield. <laughs> Um, it's important to say in a public setting how CBO can be responsive going forward and what can Congress do and what can this committee do to get CBO to have the tools necessary. And, you know, that might be budget. And my friend was talking about your, your budget and what your staff looks like or outside groups or whatever. We've got to be able to do that, to be able to take into account. And I just wanted to hear your comments on it. The dynamic impact of driving prices down by having transparency. You don't have to comment on the policy of it, mm -hmm. but to be able to assess what that impact would be if we do that, right? No one knows, but yet we get told, oh, that'll cost a trillion dollars. So then it's dead on arrival, but we can never have a creative way to approach making sure that American people have doctors and you know can go to the doctors of their choice and have choice. Instead, we're stuck with, that'll cost a trillion dollars. And I'm not faulting you, uh, I think, but I'm faulting this very broken system. We've got to find a way to break that. So I just wonder if you have any comments on what that might look like besides what I know would be an easy answer, which is more staffing, you know, which, which I get, but if, could you comment on that? Not, then I'll yield back. Okay, you. um, and you've hit on my, not just my goal, but my mission to be responsive and to be transparent, to respond to, you know, your interest in, in this legislation. I know many others have the same interest and to do it in a way that you can understand. If you agree or disagree, at least we'll understand what the differences are. On something like this, the kind of change to the, the tax um, benefits in the healthcare system, we would work with the Joint Committee on Taxation, so it would depend on their capacity as well. But we, you know, we have the ability, it's just you know, the health committees, boy, they, they keep us busy basically full time. And so we're just constantly struggling to get we, the We water. call that a hamster wheel, but anyway, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get the water level to here instead of here, but, um, but we absolutely have the, 
ability. <clears throat> it's just the. What has the CBO generally and you specifically learned from those conversations facilitated by the task force stakeholders? Yeah, no, no, thank you. And, and thank you again for having us participate and putting us together with these outside groups. And we've continued to engage with them. So the letter, um, it's shown up in my social media feeds and I, I've read it. Our analyst working on this has, has read it. And there's some things in there which, you know, I wish they would do a little bit more to understand what we're doing. But there's some things where we're like, oh yeah, they're right. We need to do it differently. And so we will, we, we're continuing to work on our modeling of the effect of um, negotiation on innovation. And we're gonna implement some of what is, is in the, as I understand it, okay. is in the letter. And I hope you would work with me to explore how if CMMI is not working out, perhaps the Physicians Tech Technical Advisory Commission, which was already established in law in the macro legislation, how we could use that to in fact achieve some of the savings models that were supposed to be achieved in CMMI. Okay, no, no, I, you have that commitment. You were right on CMMI. We, we finally acknowledge it. Wait, wait, say that again. For, uh, say it for the, the people. Uh, the record attention. will reflect, so ordered. I approve, <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. It, it I was while, right. But, you, but, but we, we put it out. And, but you know, I, and seriously, I, I look forward to working with you on the physicians, the, the other advisory committee. Can I get you to call my wife and tell her that I was right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Swagel, thank you. Thank you. Now, you've put your finger on one of the challenges I face, is that right, you're, the bill would, would recognize that pharmacists provide healthcare services and are a key, you know, key way that, that people get uh, healthcare provided. You, you do also realize that pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professionals in America. 95% of all Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy. All of us, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, want the same thing when it comes to health care. Accessible, affordable, mm -hmm. quality health care. No, that's, that, that's right. And, um, and the challenge I face is that the committees with jurisdiction over Medicare, their workload has been so heavy that you know, they would never say to us, and we would never listen, don't do that bill. But they'll have other priorities. And... I have to, I have to you know, do what the, the, where the committee is going first. That's what I have to do first. So I can only apologize that we just we haven't been able to do it yet. And, and I agree well, with you. Can, it's, can it's you commit to me that you'll, you'll come up with a score for me soon? Uh, let me come back to you on, on that. I can't, I can't give you that commitment now. Panel of advisors. Yeah. I, I know that that's important. Um, but, but in your website, you, you say members of this panel generally serve two-year terms and are sometimes reappointed, but that's, that's kind of vague. Tell me, who appoints these members and uh, these boards, and how do you ensure bipartisanship? Mm -hmm. yeah, so they're appointed by, by me as director. Most of them, or many of them, were on the, the panel when, when I arrived. It's a very distinguished group. Are they compensated? Uh, it's like $500 a year. You know, so it's a, and the travel to that would, that would be a no. <laughs> I mean, it's virtually no. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. And um, it, it, it's bipartisan. So we have members, we have people who worked in the Trump administration, Obama, Bush, um, Clinton. Does anybody check you on this or? We do. We do. do you submit them to, to, to the committee to, to. I mean, they're on our, they're on our website. So it's, it's public. The meetings, we have two meetings a year, and congressional staff attend the meetings. Well, one of the reasons for this hearing is to see how we can do better in, yeah. in helping you. And we, we do want to help you. And, and perhaps there, there should be a process where you submit names and, and the committee approves them. Or, you know, that would keep you from uh, whoever is in that position. It would keep them from criticism and, and make sure that we were getting bipartisanship in that. Yeah. It's... You know, I guess I wouldn't support that, and I'll explain, because this is a this is a group of you know of really distinguished academic, mainly academics, not all, but mainly, who are doing this. You know, they're basically not paid, as you said, and they do it for public service and to help us. And I would just want to keep them out of the political kind of the political realm as much as possible. You know, be as transparent as we are, and and your staff can attend the meeting. I mean, we have you know, lots of congressional staff. All right, I, I'm going to have to absorb that and, okay. and, and kind of think about that for a while before I press on with it. And there is some perception that you may or may not be aware of, I don't know if it's been alleged today, that CBO has leaned left, has leaned to the other side. Um, 
And I will, uh, with the IRS funding, uh, it was projected, uh, the increased IRS funding, that was part of the Inflation Increase Act, it was projected that it would bring in $2.9 billion in fiscal year 23, but it only was $160 million. This year, CBO has expected, the IRS, or projected the IRS would, funding would bring in uh, $7.8 billion this year, but so far it's only $360 million. Can you speak to that? Yeah. It's, it's, again, it's a challenging part for us because we have to figure out, well, where is the IRS going to spend their money and how quickly? They wouldn't tell us. You know, maybe they didn't even know at the time. And so we just said, okay, they're going to put the money in the place where they get the highest return you know, from the, the past studies. In the end, they did it differently. They went into customer service. So as you said, they didn't spend the money on the kind of tax and collection. Again, that's some of the justification that they made for the IRS expansion was here's the revenue is going to come from it. But conversely, if you go back to the TCJA uh, tax bill from a few years ago, uh, CBO projected revenue would be 22.6 trillion mm -hmm. uh, from 2018-23, but actual revenue was at over a trillion dollars higher, 23.6 trillion um, than what, what was projected. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>